Um, well, I wanted to start off by giving a huge thank you to the GNET team for their excellent work in coordinating this, uh, the third annual gathering of, of the GNET. And um, Dr. Saltman will remember when we first started to look at bringing together a set of experts, diversity of both topics and geography was at the top of the requirements for an organization that could host this kind of research symposium. So. I'm incredibly proud and happy to, to see the excellent lineup that we've brought together today. Um, so without further ado, I'd love to start off by introducing our panelists. Um, I will start with Fula Aina, it is, who is a PhD student in the African Leadership Center. Fula is an international security and development policy expert. He completed a second master's degree in African studies at the African Center Studies Center at the University of Oxford in 2017. He's previously obtained his master's <clears throat> in international development and policy from Seoul National University in South Korea in 2013. Um, he's, he's currently a doctoral fellow in the Leadership Studies um, Center with reference to security and development at the African Leadership, at the African Leadership South Center. And Fula um, is going to be leading us, um, starting us off today, followed by Mustafa Ayad, um, who is the Executive Director at ISD for Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. Um, he's the author of IS, multiple ISD reports. I won't go through them because, because some of them I took personally because they touched on some of my own, but we won't, we won't go into that. Um, that's, followed, that's followed by John, who is joining us on Zoom, um, and will also be joining uh, the Q&A. John, John Sunday Odro is a doctoral researcher at the School of um, Area Studies, History, Politics, and Literature at the University of Portsmouth in the UK. Um, so moving right along, these panelists are incredibly impressive. Manira Mustafa, who is with us as well, um, is the founder, executive director, and principal consultant at Chisora Group, and she's got over a decade under her belt of extensive experience in private, public, and military security sector. She's a non-residential fellow at Newslines Institutes for, Strategic, for Strategy and Policy in DC, um, and a fellow at the Verb Research and Independent Research Collective. And she focuses there on military society relations in, Indo, in the Indo-Pacific region um, and the political developments therein. Uh, she's also, she also holds a master's degree from the UCL and um, is, we're very excited to have her here today. And then finally, uh, Mona Kakar, who is joining us also virtually, she's a junior research fellow with the International Center for the Study of Violence and Extremism. And her research focuses on financial networks um, of extremist groups and propaganda of the IS um, and Al-Qaeda with an emphasis on South Asia and India. So I've done an interesting job of doing all the intros on a morning of this kind. Um, I just want to start off by handing over to our panelists to give us a, um, a few remarks, and then we're going to open it up to Q&A. Some of our panelists are virtual, so I just want to make sure that we're taking their, um, their participation into account, and I'm going to rely on Maddie for that. Okay, I'm handing over. Right. Well, you want to start us off? Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I've been told today to talk about um, Islamic uh, extremism. In West Africa. Uh, and I would just like to, I mean, that's quite a broad topic. And so I'd like to talk a bit more about just some, just perhaps to start off with an overview of what the situation looks like currently. And then I'll focus on Nigeria, which is where uh, my research and John's research focuses on. So what we've seen happening in recent times in West Africa is we've seen uh, the emergence of non-state actors, you know, uh, particularly well, violent extremist non-state actors, but particularly with affiliations to Al-Qaeda and also to um, ISIS. Uh, but we also have some other ones who just fall somewhere in between. Uh, and if you know anything about both groups, uh, they don't necessarily uh, share the same ideologies, even, they're, even though they're both politically uh, driven. Um, so we, what we've seen in... Um, countries like Mali, where we have um, Ansaru. There's, there's a group called Ansaru. Now, this is different from Ansaru Din uh, in uh, Nigeria. So just to bear in mind, there are two Ansarus in uh, West Africa. There's one in Mali, and there's one in, in Nigeria. And then also we have um, Akin, that's Al-Qaeda and Islamic group, also operating within the region. And there's also um, another group called Mujaw within the region as well. Uh, there's uh, Katibat Matina, also in the region, 
We have the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara as well, ISGS. And then um, um, also uh, there's Jinin, Jamatsu, Nasr, Al-Islam, well, Muslimin. Now, the, what these groups have uh, essentially done is they've tried to absorb state power and try to create their own versions of the state within the state, you know. And um, uh, in, in more recent times, the situation on the ground has become a lot more complex because we've seen uh, the influence of external actors, you know, including uh, the US, France, um, the UK, and of course, also uh, in more recent times, China and Russia. Uh, but with Russia, uh, the dynamics become even more interesting because uh, China, Russia's influence in the region is mostly driven by um, Wagner Group. And what Wagner Group has done on the ground is basically to cause more chaos. And they've very much been involved in um, illegal extraction of gold, um, gold mining. So basically that's what they use to fund the operations within this region. And of course, to a large extent, also the war in uh, between Russia and, and, and Ukraine. So Russia's footprints on the region are quite significant. Um, in the region, I'm talking most particularly at, um, Looking more specifically at the Sahel region, where you have Mali and Burkina Faso, and some other countries also within that region where Russia seems to be having some significant inroads. And just also a quick digression. Uh, so the, right now there's war in Sudan. So um, Russia's foot, footprints are all over Sudan, especially because Sudan has gold. You know, so they're also operating very much in the region. But that, but then coming back to the subject of um, ex, um, Islamic extremist organizations. There's also every tendency to uh, see Russia also trying to, in some ways, um, court some of these groups. But what they've done in the case of Chad, which is located in the Lake Chad Basin region, is we've seen um, Wagner Group essentially trying to recruit Chadian rebels on the ground. And there's no, um, I mean, the fact that they're already able to do that means that there's also a tendency that we may begin to witness uh, Wagner Group, you know, having a closer relationship with um, violent non-extremist groups on the ground, especially with regards to the supply of weapons, arming them, and also providing some forms of um, um, training. Uh, so basically, that's just an overview of what's happening on the ground. But I'd like to go very quickly to uh, Nigeria, which is where my own um, research focuses on. So in Nigeria, we have primarily three broad groups. Uh, violent extremist, Islamic extremist groups. The first is um, Boko Haram, also known as JAS, or JAS J, depending on the main cliche reason. Um, and then uh, Boko Haram's first breakaway faction, which is called Ansaro. Now, in 2011 or 13, I can't remember the exact date right now, um, Ansaru was responsible for bombing the UN headquarters. In, in, uh, in Nigeria. So that's where Ansaru took it, um, you know, it became very um, um, prominent and very famous. But shortly after those attacks, Ansaru went underground, okay, in Nigeria, because they were essentially, um, they had a fallout with um, Boko Haram's, the leadership in Boko Haram over ideological differences. So um, Jazz is known to be more, very, very extremist in their um, uptake of um, um, Islamism. Whereas um, Ansaru had problems with the way in which Jazz was always attacking fellow Muslims, all right? So they decided to break away from um, 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 Jazz. And then in 2015, um, when ISIS Corps started making inroads into Africa, uh, they approached Jazz and asked that Jazz should pledge allegiance to ISWAP. So what, sorry, to, to ISIS. So uh, the head of Jazz at the time, known as Shekau, did pledge um, allegiance to ISIS, but because after pledging allegiance to ISIS, there was to be a leadership tussle. They wanted someone else to be above him, and he wasn't going to take that. So he decided to stay on in charge of Jazz, and then a different faction broke out of Jazz again. So in 2015, we had ISWAP, you know, coming out of um, of Jazz, and ISWAP is the Islamic State in the West African province, uh, which was headed by uh, Al Banawi, right? Uh, but in 20 I think it was 2021, or 2020. Um, based upon the differences between both groups, um, ISWAP staged an attack on Jazz and they killed um, Shekau, basically, who was the leader of um, Jazz, Boko Haram. And whatever's left of Boko Haram has now moved towards the fringes of the Chad Basin region and has been headed by some guy called Malam Bokura. All right. Uh, and that's basically just a quick summary of what the situation is on the ground. But I'm going to go into how these groups operate in terms of their online footprints 
and all of that. So some of the findings from research being conducted shows that um, in, in Nigeria, what ISWAP, has, what ISWAP does basically is during operations on the ground, they use mostly um, WhatsApp to communicate. They only use WhatsApp during ongoing operations, all right? But before operations and after operations, they use Telegram. That's quite significant, quite a significant difference. And the reason why is because they use WhatsApp because it's easier to communicate during these ongoing operations, you know, uh, but for Telegram, the idea basically is to be able to um, share information with your fighters just before the attacks and also to lay claims to attacks after um, these attacks have been have been carried out. Uh, in the past five years also, uh, ISWAP has found it very difficult to use Facebook and Twitter. So they hardly use Facebook and Twitter anymore because the, what, what's happened is the Nigerian intelligence services have been able to infiltrate you know, these channels on Facebook and Twitter. So they hardly use Facebook and Twitter anymore. They mostly just uh, stick to uh, um, Telegram. But then also in more recent times, uh, as recently as just a few uh, months ago, uh, the Nigerian intelligence services have been very successful at infiltrating the SWAP's channels on Telegram. So what they do now is um, they use a different platform called Rocket Chat. They mostly use Rocket Chat now. And um, they've tried to put in place some more stringent measures to gain access to their Telegram channels. So one of the, uh, the two primary requirements for getting access to these channels is when you try to, um, you know, when you notify them that you want to join the channels, the first question they ask is, from which command do you come from, right? And then the second question they ask is, who is your commander? So if you cannot answer these two questions accurately, they kick you out of the uh, Telegram channels. So that's basically how they ensure you know that these uh, channels are infiltrated by Nigerian security forces. Uh, and then speaking very quickly about um, Ansaru. So what Ansaru does is, Ansaru has been very successful at using Facebook, but not just using it uh, in terms of open communication, but what they've done is to leverage on the local languages in Nigeria. So if you know anything about Nigeria, Nigeria is a very diverse country. It's got over 200 um, ethnic groups with over 200 languages. So I'm Nigerian, but I can only just speak two, for example. You know, there's so many languages. But what, is, what Ansaro has done is to try to translate um, communications using these local languages. So that way they're able to have a wider reach and wider um, appeal amongst um, those who try to um, um, recruit. Um, with Boko Haram, what Boko Haram has been able to do with regards to online um, communication is they have tended to maintain mostly uh, Twitter and also Telegram, all right? But some other interesting dynamics on the ground also shows that because of the fact that these uh, groups are cognizant of the fact that um, uh, Nigerian intelligence services are on their heels, they're beginning to use, um, acquire um, trial mobile phones, satellite phones, uh, trial satellite phones. And they also use a lot of encrypted messaging, you know, for, for, for communication. And as, uh, in fact, monthly they have, they spend as much as over $6,000 on just um, upping their um, comms um, equipment, just to get, you know, a headway, you know, above, um, ahead of the um, uh, Nigerian security forces. Uh, uh, and also um, something else that they've begin, they're beginning to do right now, uh, both uh, whether it's ESWAP, whether it's Ansaru, whether it's um, uh, Jazz, is that on social media, they are a bit more um, direct with their recruits. So they actually tell people, and I think, for, so from, from what I can gather, I think a lot of these instructions are coming from ISIS core. So there's been a lot of push for more people to migrate towards West Africa. Because even though the evidence is very sketchy, but there's every indication that ISIS core is more interested in establishing base in West Africa. I mean, since the fallout of the um, situation um, um, in, in Syria. So uh, that's where things are currently at the moment. Uh, this, this, these, uh, these groups are gaining some significant grounds um, with regards to the infiltrations and how they recruit people using online social media channels and also communicating. But more importantly, they're also experiencing setbacks because uh, the um, intelligence services are always, you know, um, on, on, on their heels. So that's what we've seen happening in terms of dynamics on the ground. Thank you. Thank you so much. For that. And I wanted to just flag that John is on the on the line with us, but is going to be joining us for the q and I'm going to move us over to Mustafa, um, who is not, who's not going to say anything that's that about the work that I do at all. Yes. <laughs> um, you didn't hear him, but he said, I will try not I, to. 
I was supposed to talk about Islamist extremism. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Islamist extremism. I'm going to talk about Arab Nazis, Arab and Iranian Nazis, and accelerationists, uh, and their spread across multiple platforms. And you might be familiar with this. You might be not. I, I don't know. I, I am going to note that some of this might be a bit triggering. I, I don't know if we're supposed to use that word anymore. Uh, there's going to be some imagery that is not violent, but uh, bad, um, like vulgar language, epithets, things of that nature. So I just want to, if, if you don't want to view it, I can scroll past it very quickly, or uh, I could just turn it off, uh, one of the two. I don't know how you'll tell me other than raise your hand. Uh, also, I have un undiagnosed ADHD, so if I go off on a tangent, uh, I, I apologize. Let me just start from the beginning, um, sort of the beginning. And but first of all, the online terrorist content on social media, especially in the Middle East and North Africa, there is a burgeoning uh, Nazi movement, neo-Nazi, Third Reich Nazi, and accelerationist movement across Egypt, uh, Iraq, and Iran. Iran is linked to, uh, a lot of it is linked to the Sunka party, Maybe you're familiar with the Sunka party, maybe you're not. It is a party that was set up in the late, I wanna say 50s, 40s, uh, I could be wrong here. And uh, Egypt has a very big role in harboring Nazis under the Gamal Abdel Nasser regime, specifically with the Spokil uh, Arab or Voice of the Arabs radio. So they actually took people from Goebbels, I, I believe Goebbels number two in, in charge of that radio station, as well as within the security service. So there's a history uh, that goes back. Iraq, similar things, especially with the Baptist Party, uh, also mimicking a lot of uh, sort of Nazi movement uh, aesthetics, as well as just edicts. Um, so one of the biggest issues across the Middle East is beyond this sort of terror content is looking at hate content really trying to classify hate content, hate speech across multiple platforms. One part of that, of course, is neo-Nazis, Nazis, and accelerationists across these multiple platforms. They primarily focus on things like Shia Sunni divides, as well as uh, uh, attacking human rights activists online, uh, whether that's on Twitter, whether that's on Facebook, whether that's on Telegram, they do it often. And it's intimately tied to hypernationalism. I haven't really defined hypernationalism beyond the fact that it goes beyond simple nationalism. Like I love my country. And it goes beyond that to a point of I actually want to hurt someone for my country and what it means to me and the ethnicity and religion that is affiliated with my country uh, more broadly. Um, so in, in just to scale back a little bit and talk about hate, in, in 2019, researchers found about half of the discourse on Arabic Twitter sphere, uh, Twitter sphere was hate. It was just, it, it was like, and 42% of it was de demarcated as simply hate. So half was hate speech, and 42% of it was just hate. Much of it focused on atheists and, and, and Shia. In, in regards to what type of hate was out there on Twitter. Uh, but there remains like this sort of gap in research and analysis of looking at the hate space in Arabic in its entirety and doing that in a systematic fashion. And in the wake of the Christchurch attack, regional governments in the, specifically in the Middle East, and of course the sort of territorial demise of the Islamic State by no means online, uh, and it's shift over to Africa as well as uh, the APAC region. Um, uh, they've been calling for more online hate speech sort of actions, uh, but that's primarily that's primarily focused on government actors. So they are focused on hate speech directed towards government actors, much less civil rights or civil rights actors in the region um, and beyond. And so part and parcel of this hate. <laughs> space is uh, this not burgeoning, burgeoning Nazi and accelerationist movement. They represent a community of roughly 29,000 users spread across Telegram, 
Facebook, Twitter, and occasionally drop a couple of TikToks in there. Uh, these online communities have expanded very quickly um, and are building libraries with hundreds of gigabytes of content. We've seen this on the ISIS side. We've also seen them selling merchandise. Behind me is an actual app. This isn't a joke. They're, they're selling this in Iraq at a, at a store called Hitler. Uh, I'm, I'm not making that up. Um, and uh, e-magazines, some of which are direct copies of Western uh, Nazi magazines, as well as uh, forums. So there's one in Iran on the Stormfront uh, that actually is built off of that forum. And uh, again, online retailers. So uh, these online communities include the use of and are using synthpop, uh, synthpop aesthetics, which we've seen, fast wave, as you know, alt-right memes and third-right imagery and videos. Uh, they're similarly intertwined with cults of personalities, specifically around authoritarians. So behind me is Saddam Hussein, and he's obviously stacked in that photo and uh, has a swastika tattoo. Um, and they're, they're specifically focused on pan-Arabist visions that unite under this concept of Arab supremacy across the region. So taking away sort of what really makes the Middle East and North Africa beautiful in a sense, which is the diversity of um, our language, our ways we practice religion, uh, our ethnic mi minorities, and really focusing on how Arabs are supreme over all other sort of minorities or even democracy activism for that matter. Um, they're, they really frame things around traditionalism uh, and, and in specific, the Arab sort of supremacy model of traditionalism. Some of that imagery you can see behind me, uh, this is a falconeer with the laser eyes. Uh, if you're familiar with this, this is from a channel on Telegram. Uh, and that's sort of the Bedouin Arab supremacy aspect of things that, that, that's from an Iraqi channel about the strength of our old nomadic cultures, its traditional nature of being very focused on the man and pursuits of the falconeer, for instance. And then next to it is a pan Arab sort of vision, a uh, collage. That includes your skull mask imagery alongside various bits of pan Arab uh, iconography and ideologues, Gamal Abdel Nasser, Saddam Hussein, you name it. These networks have fused essentially um, with fascist national undercurrents in the region. They're built in the image of present day authoritarians. Uh, the modern day Baptist party and its figurehead, Bashar al Assad is revered within these Arabic uh, speaking circles as is Saddam Hussein and the autocrat Abdel Fattah Sisi of Egypt. Uh, they view them as being based in essentially bringing the, bringing the war to democracy activists in the region and those championing human rights as an acceleration towards total control. So total control of the country through their authoritarianism. Uh, they use their own range of symbols, uh, but they also borrow from other Nazi movements. They, uh, they're creating sonorats with Arab revolt motifs and pilfering skull mask aesthetics affiliated with Western uh, accelerationists. They also use language. Uh, one of the primary goals of these regional accelerationists is to expand their base of influence. So, they are actively attacking other nationalist groups that are not Nazi in uh, um, affiliation. Uh, they're challenging traditional na nationalists to debates around the merits of fascism and their own ethnic superiority. Uh, they've also created this repository behind me. Uh, this is an Egyptian one, it's called the Grand Nationalist Archive. It was originally shared on Facebook, but it was built in 2006. 
uh, it has 270 gigs of content uh, uh, that cuts the gamut across uh, extreme right Nazi movement content that's been translated into Arabic. It was built by an individual who claims he is part of uh, the Egyptian security services and fought in Sinai. So there is a link here too between military service and extremism in these contexts, especially in Sinai, where we have a almost complete blackout on what is happening between the war uh, between Egyptian states and uh, violent extremist groups such as the Islamic State and others. Primarily, a lot of smugglers are just angry because you shut down their ability to smuggle. Um, and uh, there's books from the Third Right in there, Swarm Front Iran, a Farsi language, Nazi propaganda ma magazine. And last but not least, there's more research needed. That I knew that was going to be a surprise. Um, into right-wing extremist connections to the military and security services in Europe and the United States, but also in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, we're talking about people that go, that are actively enlisted in the military and are creating YouTube videos about Rommel's cave and why that is the new Mecca for other Arabs. Um, administrators, uh, administrators in these channels claim to be officers in LCC intelligence services, as I mentioned, and one prolific Arabic pro-Nazi propagandist and others can be part of the Egyptian uh, security ministry. And with that, I'm going to end. I know I didn't get really deep into it, but I have 10 minutes, and we can talk about this later if you want. Uh, thank you. You're very welcome. Um, I told Mustafa that it never happens that you get two Egyptians on a panel and he brought up Egyptian Nazis. So, so yes. spectacular. <laughs> Excellent. Just yeah. genuinely really, really happy to do that. Um, Manira, <laughs> setting us up on a good note. We're <laughs> handing it over to you. Thank you. Um, awesome. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for having me here today. And thank you, especially to GNAT team and everyone at ICSR for organizing this conference. I'm really grateful to everyone for sharing their various findings and thoughts on these topics. And it's been very interesting to see some emerging key themes and overlapping characteristics. And I'm going to start by saying something controversial. I think the, um, the concept of nonviolent extremism is very contradicting because I think the end goal is always about violence and uh, the process uh, because the objective is to achieve purification, which is always violent in the process. So I'm gonna begin with by talking about extremism in Southeast Asia, which is often perceived through a predominantly religious lens, specifically Islamist militancy. And this, the problem with this viewpoint is that it fails to recognize the underlying political and ethno-nationalist motives behind the problem. And the pro proliferation of social media platforms has highlighted uh, how uh, the um, has highlighted how we are not appreciating the true nature of the ideologically motivated violent extremism that can also impact communities in the region negatively. And we tend to overlook the, the fact that the problem is not actually purely religious. It is in fact very partisan and very ethno-nationalist at the core. And to understand Southeast Asian politics, it's important to reassess perceptions of left-wing and right-wing ideologies and the intricate interac interactions between state and non-state um, entities. So labeling resistance against the government as terrorism or extremism can become problematic, especially in contexts where governance leans towards autocracy and democratic institutions are deteriorating, I hate that word, and freedom of speech is being limited. So in some nations in the global south, violent far-right factions are frequently ignored as they serve as an extension for suppressing political opposition, especially in scenarios where left-wing factions are lacking strength. So historic events such as the Batang Kali massacre and the purges of um, the leftists during Indonesia's Cold War era contributes to this dynamic. Even in the absence of clear societal polarization, 
right-wing politics can experience radicalization when the country's leftists are too weak to counteract the radicalized right. So in the case of Maritime Southeast Asia, or the Nusantara, online violent extremism is not simply a conflict between Islamists and the far right, but it involves a wide range of ideologies reflective of the region of the region's diversity. So the concept of reciprocal radicalization is not applicable as there's often convergence um, between Islamists and far right politics. So these misconceptions arise from three underlying assumptions that the Orientalists believe that such reactionary views are exclusive to Western societies. And two, the Western centric viewpoint that insists on separating Islamist movements from the far right. And three, the inability to identify extreme viewpoints as indicators of ethno nationalist supremacy under the veneer of centrism. Moreover, these malign actors have become increasingly proficient at employing disinformation tactics to make radical views appear politically palatable, a significant and over, often overlooked problem. So political extremists have become skilled at manipulating democratic tools and employing counterterrorism rhetoric for their own benefit. So election disinformation, the deliberate dissemination of incorrect or misleading information to sway election results, all have e emerged as a common strategy. So this can involve distributing deceptive news stories, insightful social media content, or even orchestrating digital astroturfing campaigns to instill voter uncertainty and undermine confidence in the electoral process. So to provide a brief overview of my presentation's executive summary, my investigation was motivated by the need to understand and identify the issue at hand. So for instance, attributing Malaysia's November, November general elections outcome to youth extremism, primarily due to the uh, newly introduced youth voting base is, is an oversimplification, especially considering the fact that the hateful content that was permeating TikTok at the time was a product of digital astroturfing. So um, digital astroturfing can create the illusion of broad support, which is very important to sway movements. And the question we, we must all ask ourselves is, is it really extremism if it was manufactured? So throughout the election period, sophisticated information operators typically target two potential vulnerabilities to manipulate uh, their objectives, uh, objectives, namely one, influencing voter turnout, and two, influencing voter choices. So disinformation campaigns often, sp often spread overlapping false narratives, creating recurring themes with a shared objectives, distorting the truth, undermining faith in factual information and eroding trust in legitimate governance. So these narratives frequently inc incorporate conspiracy theories, revising historical accounts, promoting ideologies like the great replacement theory, anti-Semitic sentiments, and the notions of new world order. So the overarching goal of these extremists is to gain political control. So in many low to middle income Asia Pacific nations, Hate speech and disinformation operations typically exploit existing sociopolitical anxieties. And so it's not appropriate to directly compare these operations to those involved in global power struggles, but it's crucial to acknowledge that efforts to win political favor through soft and sharp power strategies are widespread. So the role of political extremism in electoral competitions is therefore significant. Disinformation and conspiracy theories, by their nature, stoke hate speech and potential violence. Such theories are pivotal in fueling right-wing extremism, typically presenting traditional truths as threats to their existence, beliefs, lifestyles. And these theories have historically been used to radicalize individuals, promoting narratives that justify oppression and societal division. And targets are often portrayed as temporary guests, <clears throat> traitors, or pawns in clandestine schemes aimed at establishing a new world order. And these disinformation narratives can even be traced back to both domestic and foreign influence operators using a range of tactics to spread false information. And at a local level, we have the cyber troopers, or cytros, as we call it in Malaysia, trolls 
who are frequently deployed to dominate and regulate online conversation to reinforce specific narratives and distort public perception because their goal is to influence domestic policies in terms of governance. And at a foreign level, the malign influence campaigns seek to discredit election outcomes to achieve their sharp power goals. So one best example of this is, of course, Malaysia's very own Ian Miles Chong. I don't know if any of you are familiar with, with him, but he's been very, very pivotal in influencing right-wing politics in America by injecting himself into the whole scene. Social media platforms have evolved into a critical conduit for political campaigns in recent years, and this enable rapid and effective communication to vast audiences. So in fact, the manipulation of social media has become a cornerstone of information wars and election interference with the potential to compromise electoral integrity and provide an unfair advantage to its perpetrators. So the rising private disinformation industry is posing a considerable problem. And it's common knowledge that several political players in Global South nations, Malaysia included, deploy their own influence operators in the form of troll farms and cyber troopers, some of whom are fairly extremist politically. And what's worrying is that the growing sophistication of micro-targeting strategies with malicious actors using data mining and profiling to focus on specific individuals or groups, especially marginalized communities to intensify social divisions. So these techniques include using social media for mobilizing against the opposition, shaping public discourse, uh, preference divulgence and elite coordination. So red tagging, which uh, this is a tactic that involves discrediting political targets as extremists or communists, it's like our version of the McCarthyism. Um, it's a frequent tactic of disinformation and cyber trooping during election season and can have serious consequences. And these have been seen in Philippines. So instances of these issues are abundant in Southeast Asia and this demonstrate the necessity of including them in extremism studies. Social media platforms have facilitated retaking attacks against political dissidents and opponents, for example, during the recent elections in the Philippines, sorry, last year's elections in the Philippines, red tagging was very rampant on several platforms against critics of Marcos and Duterte journalists, civil society organizations, and I think someone was uh, even killed in the process. So similar trends are observed in Malaysia, especially during and after elections, with critics and political opponents being labeled as communists, terrorists, extremists, because they're powerful fodder. And the, the language of counterterrorism has become hijacked to perpetuate this. So it's crucial to remember the role Facebook played in inciting hatred and violence against the Rohingya co community in Myanmar, for instance, that paved the way for the subsequent genocide. Therefore, it's reasonable to anticipate similar strategies and interference that will manifest, um, that will manifest in upcoming uh, elections. So conspiracy theories are increasingly being used to discredit opponents with narratives such as localized great replacement theory, distortion of historical uh, facts, and propagation of anti-Semitic sentiments and new world order conspiracies. Ultimately, the goal of all extremists is to seize control of governance. Now, I've listed uh, a, a whole bunch of uh, you know, identified policy challenges and key takeaways, but I think one of the uh, difficulties here is obviously how to structure um, legal response because there are some aspects where it's not just domestic, there's also uh, inter I mean, foreign, inf um, foreign influence as well. And uh, what I understand is that even we have um, international laws, you can't mandate countries to behave responsibly because they're not going to comply with, with such uh, rulings. So what we can understand is that from all these, radical right politics is a global phenomenon and understanding the threat they pose is very important. It's critical considering the, uh, the influence within the electorate and the, their ability to sway political outcomes. And this problem extends beyond a simple technological fix. We can't solve it with tech. It requires a whole of government and societal approach. Uh, and necessitates a comprehensive policy response that can bridge 
uh, growing socioeconomic gaps. And this is why it's important to understand the role of political extremism in electoral contests. And finally, we need to challenge what we understand about extremism. It might not be exclusive about promoting a religious political order, but it might instead aim for ethno-national supremacy using religion as a means to an end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Munira. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Mona. Mona, you have 15 minutes because um, I want to make sure that we get 30 minutes for Q&A. So, handing over to Mona. So, oh, hi, hello everyone. Thank you for having me. My topic for today is uh, Islamic State in uh, India. And I would just like to quickly uh, summarize what it is going to be about. First, I'm going to be talking about how the Islamic State's propaganda uh, focused on India between 2014 and 2018. Then after, it's, uh, then after it established its Vilaya al-Hind, uh, how from 2000, between 2019 and 2022, uh, how did it grow? And after that, how Islamic State in Khurasan province emerged as the most uh, hostile anti-India branch of ISIS. So while we saw few presence, uh, few, uh, while we saw visible signs of the ISIS's presence in Mali in 2017, it was only in May 2019 that ISIS launched Vilaya al-Hind, formalizing its presence in India. I would like to briefly state how ISIS's media propaganda evolved before it lost its territory in 2019. Three e interesting events are to be considered here. First, it was only in 2016 that ISIS Central released its first ever video featuring Indian jihadists who were Islamic Mujahideen operators, a banned terrorist outfit in India. They invited Indian Muslims to join the Caliphate to avenge the atrocities for killing of Muslims in India. During this time, what we saw in India was the pro-ISIS media, uh, media efforts were, were predominantly in the Malayalam language from Kerala. Uh, the most of the messages uh, circulated on Facebook and Twitter in Malayalam language were mostly produced by fighters from Kerala who had joined ISIS in Afghanistan since, to, since 2016. However, what was interesting was pro-ISIS uh, supporter communities taking increasing interest in pushing Kashmir-centric uh, propaganda after Islamic State in Jammu and Kashmir, the now ISHP, uh, claimed first attack in 2017. Pro-Islamic state uh, Al-Gharar media was regularly uh, uh, releasing media material, criticizing the Pakistani-backed Kashmiri militant groups for waging a war for territorial and nationalistic ambitions and not instead of defending Islam. So through this, Islamic state in Jammu and Kashmir was trying to recruit the young generation of the Kashmiris who were rather more indigenous and less pro-Pakistan. Though we know that uh, ISIS couldn't expand, uh, cultivate a substantial presence in Kashmir. Then in 2019, we had a turning point as ISIS lost its biggest recruitment tool, its caliphate. ISIS saw here an opportunity to exploit the communal fishers during the citizenship amendment protest. So uh, as we know that this, uh, the citizenship amendment protest uh, transpired communal riots in Delhi, and it was like one of the worst riots to be considered in, in India's modern history. During this time, a pro-ISIS magazine called, uh, called Voice of Hind was, uh, came up in 2020-2020, in 2020, the, dedicating a, a, a detailed coverage to the CAA protest. Uh, the main aim was to recruit Indians by harnessing uh, their displeasure and grievances fueled by the rise of Hindutva nationalism. Indeed, its first uh, editorial was provocating, provocative in nature as it called upon the Indian Muslims to wage jihad against Indian states and it basically pushed the narrative that that despite Muslims being patriotism, uh, despite Muslims being patriotic uh, and nationalistic towards their homeland, they are being driven out and labeled as status. This was also for the first time that ISIS's weekly Al Namba dedicated an entire page to India. We also saw how Voice of Hind and uh, and uh, uh, Voice of Khurasan, uh, Islamic State in Khurasan Province main um, main magazine, extensively also uh, dedicated a lot of coverage to other communal uh, uh, communal clashes like the hijab ban in Karnataka. So the common, sorry, my part. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, we can still hear you if you want to keep going. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
so where was i yeah so the common uh, narrative was that they lamented how indian muslims are mere bystanders and placid to the increasing discrimination uh, in the democratic india by the end had a, had released 25 issues till now and later in uh, its last publication was in may 2022 Uh, as it discontinued its publication due, due to the secu- security crackdown lo- launched by the intelligence agencies june 2020 uh yeah june 2022 could be considered as a, as a turning point in the aftermath of the nupur sharma's controversy as a uh, islamic state in khurasan province uh, ishp sister affiliated uh, sister affiliate filled up the uh, filled up the void islamic state Uh, through its uh, unofficial uh, alazai media maintained the flow of its anti india propaganda by releasing audio and video material threatening to launch attacks in india alazai for the first time also released a polemical essay which was a lengthy dry, diatribe of ta- of taliban's growing engagement w- with with india this uh, and uh, in this magazine it also delegitimized uh, taliban's religious and uh, governing credentials uh, because it was de- uh, because it was dealing with india next uh uh alazim's voice of khurasan english language magazine have eulogized uh, a few indian fighters who fought in its ranks sorry uh we can say that since 2020 islamic state in khurasan province hasn't had really any new indian recruits in fact what was um, what was more interest in, interesting is that for targeting the religious sites of minorities like six in uh, in afghanistan it used a tajik suicide bomber which wouldn't be so symbolic in the eyes of, uh, in the eyes of the indian supporters then we come to the uh, then we come to the third phase where uh, where since 2023 uh, islamic uh, we could observe an interest in interesting trend as a uh, islamic state in khurasan province sharpened its anti india focus taliban's counter te- uh, terror- terrorism pressure on iskp had led to the killing of its main senior commander albu osman al kashmiri who was leading iskp's re- uh, recruitment efforts in-, in india surprisingly in the recent issues islamic state in khurasan province claimed responsibility for the uh, bombings that happened in su- in southern india in uh, in october and november 2022 Th- though these bombings were uh, were largely failed attacks with no casualties this was done to prove that it has a relevant su- support base and and loyal cadres in india trying to aggressively embed itself in india's domestic political discourse it also claimed support for a banned terrorist outfit called uh, popular front of india warning that it has many operatives in southern india in uh, in its la- latest voice of uh, khurasan uh, khurasan issue uh, 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 a four page article was extensively dedicated criticizing indian muslim scholars for fostering inter religious harmony with the rss leaders the ideological parent of bjp during this time we also saw a new pro isis media siratul al haq uh, uh, emerging in jan 2023 releasing two issues of magazine indicating that pro isis supporter uh, su- supporter com- community in india can come in contact with al azim for working as future propagandists i say it because through my research i came to know that al azim's many media centric articles are purportedly written by indian isis supporters the deep contextual knowledge regarding india's internal politics substantiate substantiate the claims that there are indian media contributors working with islamic state official or media branch alazim discreetly even the national investigation uh, agency india's counter terrorism agency has pointed to to this links the terror plots foiled by a uh, national investigation agency in the past indicated the foreign uh, islamic uh, islamic state cadres had the intention to, uh, had the intention to strike india so the, so i conclude that despite operational set, setback and the digital crackdown on the group uh, islamic state in khurasan province uh, the uh, uh, the isis most hostile anti india branch has strong shown uh, has has uh, shown strong resolve to reach its target audience in india so when we talk about local sol- uh, local solutions i would like to uh, shed a light on why a lot less indian muslims join islamic state despite having the second largest population as per the as per the government data only uh, around 140 to 200 indian muslims uh, went overseas to join isis 
First, Indian Muslims have been culturally assimilated into, in, uh, into India since independence or even before that. They have also adopted India's unique cultural traditions and have always preached, uh, preached secularism. Apart from that, Muslim communities in India are heterogeneous. That is, they are, they are divided by ideology, for example, Varevalis and Deobandis, social certification, schools of jurisprudence, by seminaries and also by geographical and language factors. This heterogeneity indirectly insulated Indian Muslims from extremist ideolo ideologies like ISIS. Indian clerical movement, uh, mainly the Salafi or mainly the Salafi or organ organizations, Jamiatul Al Hadid and, uh, uh, and 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 the Kerala Salafis or organizations la, uh, hold a sway over over the faith of Ind Indian Muslims that acted as a bulwark. Predominantly, what what worked in India's favor was the community outreach efforts by religious Muslim scholars of various schools who demotivated young Muslims from falling prey to ISIS's ideology. Example, many Salafi organizations have, ad, uh, have ad, advocated, uh, uh, have, uh, for example, like, like Jamia Tulal Hadith, Kerala Nadwatul Mujahideen, they had issued many fatwas denouncing ISIS's action as, as un-Islamic. In fact, what is interesting is nearly 1,050 Islamic scholars and Imam issued a joint, joint fatwa in India condemning ISIS's violent killings. India lacks a coherent counter-terrorism and counter-radicalization policy. From the data that is avail available to us, we only know of the de-radicalization drives undertaken by Maharashtra and Kerala security agencies. It is interesting to note that these were the states that produced most number of the um, most number of the men and women that uh, that joined ISIS in Afghanistan and Syria. Maharashtra's anti-terrorism squad aimed at initiating anti-radicalization programs focused on promoting democratic values in Muslim minority schools like Urdu schools, compulsory national cadet crop services, and in independent media channels to propagate what the government says was was to propagate the mainstream values of secularism and democracy. Kerala's de-radicalization drive called Operation Pigeon in 2017 claimed us saving 350 youth from joining ISIS. Though we don't know much regarding the, regarding the structure and uh, structure of these de-radicalization de uh, campaigns. What was most, most interesting was, the, uh, was that the government included the narratives of those who returned disillusion from ISIS joining Syria. They were used to prevent others from joining ISIS. Uh, to quote, I would like to give an example of an Indian ISIS returnee who, uh, through India, uh, through the help of the India's intelligence agency, uh, made made his way back to India in mid uh, 2014. He said that he was. I'm, gonna, I'm so sorry. I'm going to interrupt you because we only have uh, two more minutes. So just giving you a heads up. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, this was it. So uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, an Indian ISIS returning in 2014 said that he was subjected to racism by the group and was forced to do manual tasks like cleaning of toilets and not trained to fight on the front line. So the stories of these illusion, uh, these uh, disillusioned fighters uh, returned these these this, this, these disillusioned fighters uh, served as valuable counter narratives for the government to counter online online ra radic radicalization. The uh, the IV officials also posed as ISIS recruiters on Twitter, communicating with ISIS supporters to monitor their movements. But the results of these campaigns were never made public, and the lack of resources and funding are also impediment making such endeavors limited in this day. Thank you. Thank you, Mana. Um, we have a excellent lineup of speakers, and that means that I want to make sure that everybody gets the opportunity to ask some questions. So I'm going to do something a little um, radical since Mustafa already set up Egyptians as, as leaning towards that. Um, I'm going to keep a three minute timer on for all of the answers so that I can at least get a good number of questions and answers in. So I'm going to start off with one that is already in the in the Q&A online, and then I'm going to open it up to everybody in the room. So please start preparing your questions while, uh, while Mustafa gets to this one. Um, question for Mustafa. To what extent, if any, have you seen a trend in hyper-nationalism, Nazism, uh, spread amongst diaspora communities outside of the MENA region? And timer is on. I would uh, like, I'd like to answer this question truthfully. And most of the uh, sort of hyper-nationalists that lean towards uh, Nazism, acceleration uh, seem to be primarily based in the MENA region mm -hmm. and not part of the larger diaspora. 
that is probably because uh, there is an active uh, quote unquote culture war happening in the MENA region, just as there's an active culture war happening in the West. And it's been happening for some time. And it, that culture of war for Nazis is slightly, I guess, parallel or reverse of the same sort of culture war that Islam has fought, fought in the region, which is essentially this, this war against degeneracy uh, within their own societies. Degeneracy in quotes, right? I'm, I don't. I don't think they're degenerate. Um, at the end of the day, it's also a modern versus tradition uh, or a tradition versus modernity fight that they're also fighting that's, again, parallel to the Islamist and accelerationist in the region. They're fighting uh, gender demarcation, gender fluidity. They're fighting Islamists, so like the Muslim Brotherhood, um, Islamic State, you name it, on that Nazi accelerationist side in the region. They're also fighting uh, for what they believe to be the soul of the "quote unquote" Arab nation, mm -hmm. and the 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 way you hasten uh, you hasten the speed by which Arabs become supreme is by uh, eliminating all those elements. Since we have a a few more seconds, can you elaborate on if you are seeing? an extremist rhetoric that's coming from the from the West into the Middle East impact the kinds of, of terminology that we use to describe these movements. Just the fact that we're using accelerationism and Nazism to describe them, is that built into the way that these networks operate as well? Yeah, I mean, they refer to themselves as, I mean, they'll refer to themselves as Nazis. Interesting. Uh, Interesting. And they won't refer to themselves as accelerationists, but they're using the exact same aesthetics. So, um, you know, the idea that it's Assad or or we burn the country mm. is embedded in accelerationism. I, I, I can't think of a more maybe I can't accelerate it, mm. but like I can't think of a phrase or an image or a, a chance that really distills it down more than that. Mm. Um, yeah, maybe there's a maybe there's a classification system that that needs to be built for sort of extreme right actors in the Middle East. Uh, which sort of echoes what Manir is saying to a certain extent that we're using Western descriptors of non-Western non-Western phenomenon, and that seems to be undercutting our ability to understand these movements. One hundred percent, and I'm feeding into that, so I, I should probably be beat. Her. <laughs> we'll take care of that. Um, okay, I'm going to open it up to the floor, and as always, we've got an eager participant. Go for it. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, so. Uh, we're seeing a lot of pan Arabism and Arab. Uh, microphone. Yeah, I think you're on Probably keep online. Hey, um, so we're seeing a lot of like pan Arabism and um, uh, and uh, Arab supremacy in Libya. At the same time, it's a society that's kind of gone the accelerationist way of deteriorating the state. I'm wondering like how that plays out, and also like how that plays out in terms of. Um, Malicious uh, that might be uh, more Nazi or accelerationist uh, aligned outside of formal military systems. As you yeah. were speaking about, I'm gonna yeah. I'm, I might pause there and and get two more questions. Thank you, John. Got somebody in the room. Galen England Extremism and Gaming Research Network. A uh, quick question from Mustafa and one from Anira. Mustafa, I'm curious on the interplay of uh, Western or European neo-Nazi and white supremacist groups and what you're seeing happen in the Middle East. So if you go back to like the origins of Third Reich's affiliations with Persian Aryanism and kind of conceptualizations of how that relationship was developed in the 30s and 40s, do you see a similar reciprocal relationship now or not? Is that kind of developing separately? And then Manira, when, when we talk about government-led repurposing of extremist political ideologies and things like red baiting. Um, what potentials do you see to push back against that in research spaces or in policy spaces when there's still a need to engage with government actors? Where is the line there? And do you have any suggestions for how to, to balance that relationship? Okay, I'm gonna Thanks. take one more up here and then I'll, I'll come to Aaron in the next one. Thank you. 
uh, Anna Meyer, University of Nottingham. Um, I've got a question for Manira. Uh, Manira, I loved your provocation that nonviolent extremism is an oxymoron. Um, and I wonder if that could lead us to think about violence, not only as an end goal, but what we think violence is. Um, I think in structural violence, epistemic violence, um, do you think that that's a useful way of approaching these sorts of movements? Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Mustafa to answer the two questions you've got. Can I actually let Munira go oh, first? Oh, go for it. So I can think. <laughs> Thank you for the question, uh, Galen. Um, truthfully, I think it's a very difficult question to tackle um, because we have to understand what is government and what is governance. There's, um, from my point of view, as a former government uh, officer myself, I think gov I mean, government's role is clear, but the distinction is who leads the government is that influences the policy is the question. So when it comes to this, to PCVE space, um, I think there needs to be a, a reckoning on how we approach um, PCV, PCVE. And we need to um, identify who are the people who are doing the work. Um, because there are, I mean, I've seen in some instances where it gets hijacked and, and that can be, that can set some dangerous precedents because our definition of extremism is so broad for one thing and different governments have very different definition for, for extremism and terrorism. And, you know, like from what I'm seeing so far, even in Florida, for instance, it's a good example of, of DeSantis saying that, uh, you know, uh, vilifying LGBTQ, the marginalized as, you know, uh, uh, completing them in, in, in the bad people category. So how, I think, to approach PCBE, I mean, it requires an effort to be conscientious. Um, and But again, I think that's also a big ask because what do we mean by being conscientious? Because we can't gatekeep the field, obviously. Uh, we need uh, you know, more distinct voices to participate. So I, I, again, this boils down on the inclusivity of the stakeholders, but we also have to be accountable in our approach. And that's the best thing I can say. And again, like we can establish order and, th and, and laws, but the conflict is that even if we, like right now we have international laws on human rights, but we can't really enforce it on, on nations that refuse to, to sign on um, those laws. So how do we bring people to accountability? So that is a dilemma. And for the second question for Anna, um, sorry, could you repeat the question again? Oh yeah, about how we view extra um, violence. Um, so I think when um, one of my grievances studying extremism is that we tend to overlook conditions, the conditions of where we exist. Just because we can't see the kinetic violence doesn't mean it's not there. And that's what influences the actors and their ability to maneuver um, their actions, because in some security environment is too strong. This is why we see different level of violence across, across the board. You don't see the same kind of political violence in Malaysia as you do in Indonesia or Philippines, because the, the conditions are so different. So the question is, how permissible is it to exert those kind of violence? <laughs> I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Manira. Enough time, or should I yeah. give you more time? <laughs> Uh, so on pan-Arabism, I'm, I'm not going to say that all pan-Arabism is bad, right? It, it, you can you can debate that all you want. Um, however, uh, the, the thing about pan-Arabism is that a the wiping away of borders, ethnicity, sort of the coming together of an Arab nation ultimately feeds into the core concepts of this sort of supremacy within these circles. And then another part of that is I'm I'm definitely positive there's Libyan like accelerationists 100% that are part of these group chat channels. There's one, and I, I really didn't talk about the anti-Semitism piece of this because the anti-Semitism piece of this is incredibly overt, right? Um, but there's also a Palestinian liberation piece about this that also has to be recognized, which is the failure of the ability of Palestinian people to be recognized is also a primary grievance on uh, across ideologies within the region. 
Um, and one of it manifests itself in very hateful, horrible ways, as we can see here. Uh, and, and some of it uh, manifests itself in more insidious ways. Um, now, uh, I think that answers your question, kind of, sort of. Uh, now, in terms of militias, um, I, I just know that they're parts of group chats. They're not necessarily militia members, but they're supporters of specific militia groups and leaders. And they see that as a viable one, there are ideologues that they can point to that are gonna bring about or have brought about the demise of the state in Libya. And that it's only biding time until, until they rise. In terms of development and parallels, yeah, there's tons of history. We can go back to the Egyptian Nazi party. We can go back to the Sunka party in Iran. You can go back to a, a range of different sort of on the ground movements. Uh, political parties, uh, political ideologues who have champion. I mean, it, it, the, the, there's an open joke in the Middle East that you, you can get, and it's true, you, you can get mind confident on every street corner, right? And does that necessarily mean the entire population of the Middle East is, is radicalized towards Hitler? No. Um, but it does, uh, it does speak to a root cause, I think, in some in some ways, and out of that grew a new generation of Nazis that we're seeing online that are very familiar with the Western Nazi uh, sort of eco ecosystem. So these are members who in group chats have said they're, they they participated in Stormfront. They speak Arabic, English, and in some cases, German, mm. um, sometimes French, depending on if they're from North Africa, uh, what part of North Africa they're from. Uh, oh, sorry. And I'm supposed to stop, but there are parallels. <laughs> I thought I was smooth there. I thought that was done very smoothly. I thought that was smooth. Um, okay, I'm I'm gonna hand over a question from our online Q and A to Fulla. Uh, you mentioned that the extremist recruiters in West Africa are being more direct on online platform platforms when it comes to recruitment. Can you elaborate on that, and how is that different from ISIL's overall recruitment strategies? Okay, so what we're seeing, you know, uh, with their direct recruitment strategies is uh, basically trying to paint the state as the enemy mm -hmm. of the people. Uh, so, for instance, they in their online campaigns, they try to depict the um, narrative that the state is responsible for some of the economic hardships that the people, the locals uh, face. And then sometimes, perhaps maybe when there are uh, military operations where we have civilian casualties, they tried to also paint this narrative that um, these um, casualties or these operations were done intentionally, you know, with the aim of actually uh, uh, affecting civilian populations. You know, so that's one of the things they've always tried to capitalize on. It's all part of the broader, um, you know, um, propaganda intended at um, pitching um, citizens against the state, mm -hmm. creating some form of mistrust between the state and society, and then basically leveraging on these grievances you know, to get recruitments from um, local um, um, populations. Uh, and also, one other thing they've also tried to do with regards to their online recruitment strategies is to promise people of a better life uh, here on Earth and also a better life, you know, after, you know, um, um, that's basically one of the things they've tried to do. And this, in many ways, is different from what ISIS does because ISIS um, recruitment strategy has mostly reflective of um, storytelling mm. narratives, you know, so they always, um, you know, they come in a very subtle way to try to like depict stories around uh, what people face, how uh, how basically um, people find themselves, um, you know, segregated in society. And they try to identify themselves as people who understand the plight the common people, whereas for these other core Al-Qaeda groups or other you know groups within the West African region, they come more directly to say the state is your enemy. And so we offer an alternative. And that's why they're always very keen on trying to establish, you know, uh, a caliphate uh, that depicts a state within the state itself, you know, that offers different services. So for instance, um, in more practical ways in on the ground, what we've seen them do is uh, during, I'll just tell you, Mohammed, uh, during Ramadan, for example, they also provide some forms of um, relief packages 
you know, medical services. They also offer um, arbitrary services in terms of um, maybe things like um, where there's dispute, local disputes on the ground. They try to, you know, mediate against various factions. They offer court services. So they're basically creating a state within the state, state to, show, to show the locals that whatever the state is doing, we can do it better. Mm -hmm. And you are uh, better off joining ours, mm -hmm. you know, okay. than, you know, remaining within the state. That's one of the direct ways in which they try to recruit. Which we've seen with ISIS with previously ISIS. as well. Yes. So that, that's an interesting one. Yeah. Um, Mona, I think I have one for you that um, has been asked a few times here. Um, can can you talk us through the current state of far-right extremism in India? And I'm opening that to Manira or Mona. And can I ask um, that our, our colleagues that are joining us online turn their camera on, if at all possible? Oh, I really don't uh, have not followed like far-right extremism. My focus is more on the influence of the Salafi jihadist groups on India's propaganda. So I would really don't think I would be able to add much on that. But I do think that the Hindutva, like the BJP's narrative is going strong and you can see how like more, you can see how it's, how Modi's uh, influence is growing in the in the Western nations as well. Mm. So, and I think most of the uh, most of the countries that are dealing with India currently, they know that it is happening. They know that the fueling uh, Hindutva nationalism is uh, somewhere you know alienating the Muslim section of the population, but they are still remaining silent con considering the strategic interest in mind. So I think they are, they are just, uh, they are just sidelining it and just for the started, uh, strategic interest. So mm -hmm. strategic interest takes preced precedence ultimately over everything I feel. I'm going to hand it over to Manira because I think you might be able to add some color to what Manira already highlighted. Uh, could you repeat the question again? Sure. Um, as we look at the, the exacerbation of extremism within India, um, can you shed some light on what you're seeing in terms of the far right extremist movement within India? And or if, if you have any insight on how that's being um, exported internationally to the Indian diaspora as well. Okay, so I've had this question before. Uh, someone was asking me if there, if Malaysia is in danger of having a Hindu movement, uh, you know, permeating the country, and would it be a national security threat? Hmm. So I'll be honest. Um, again, this is this boils down to conditions and permissibility. Hmm. So if we want to talk about Indian diaspora in Malaysia, I cannot. I can say there are, uh, you, you know, um, Indians in Malaysia who who uh, believe in, in, in Hindutva and, but it's not, um, it's not a threat in Malaysia. And this is why, because it's, it's still nationalist in, in its element. So to understand how nationalist movements uh, exert themselves, you have, I mean, the whole focus is on the concept of homeland. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make sense for Hindutva to be a problem in Malaysia because Hindutva is not the homeland, mm -hmm. but even then, if we talk about how the diaspora Indian community in Malaysia, uh, you know, would embrace a Hindu, I mean, sure there are, but the uh, whether or not they're going to pose a problem, unlikely. Again, this boils down to to the conditions of the security environment of, of where they are and the ability to actually express uh, the, the 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 ideology in in, a, in that violent way. It's it's not possible um, because. The, uh, Indian communities themselves are being marginalized and they're being securitized in the country. Mm -hmm. So this is one uh, aspect we should look at. We shouldn't over-exaggerate the threats, but we should uh, consider how, I mean, how is the problem, why it's a problem and where it's focused. Thank you so much for that. Um, okay, I'm gonna open it up back again to the floor, starting with Aaron, um, moving on to um, Akansha, and then we'll go over to this. Thank you so much to the speakers. I feel like we got a, a really creepy tour around the world of everything we should be worried about in different ways. Th this is kind of for all the speakers. You know, it's it's always the case that there are a couple agreed upon internationally designated groups that we all can look on and be like, yes, bad, remove everything. Those are ISIS and Al Qaeda related groups. 
uh, and their affiliates. And pretty much every other group is contested or controversial, even if they're on the UN list. Look at PKK. We all shared videos of female PKK fighters fighting against ISIS, and they're internationally designated. So a, a lot of you mentioned these more domestic extremist threats. Um, and even some of the Islamist extremist movements are very contested and not internationally agreed upon. And we all suck at domestic extremism. We all suck when we have to look at something that looks like ourselves and say, this is terrorism. Um, and I was wondering how much of the content that you're seeing online around these less agreed upon entities would be considered illegal content, even if a government is not cracking down on it. Obviously, you know, even a swastika is illegal to share in Germany, but that's not the case in most other countries. How much of this is technically illegal, but not being acted on it? And how much of this is really in that uncomfortable gray zone? And I ask this because this is the sort of guidance we want to give tech companies of how far can they go on these domestic extremist groups, even when it's hyper-nationalism, which is not usually going to be cracked down on by a government. Thank you, Aaron. Um, I think we can pass it right along, actually. Um, Munira, I mean, if we extrapolate what you just spoke about uh, in Southeast Asia, where there's extremism, where, you know, the kind of red tagging that you're talking about, or looking at the core principles of what's really hurting people, if we move it to South Asia, and I'm going to go like specifically about India, not talking the diaspora in, South, um, in Southeast Asia, um, where does the intervention start? Because a lot of it is government-backed or government-sponsored. You see the conversations infiltrating during elections, during like social conversations. Um, the responsibility, of course, can't stop or start with tech companies. And probably to like just open up that conversation a bit for um, everybody on the panel. What do you do when there is state-sponsored terrorism or extremism that is not transnational or cross-border? And that's probably like thinking about the problems with Hindutva, right? You know it's there, it's online, but the neighbor doesn't really care or the world doesn't beyond the point care because it doesn't affect anything other than the national, you know, the mother. Okay, so more questions about the domestic ecosystem versus getting buy-in externally. Yeah. Hi. Um, just a quick question for Mustafa. I wonder when you first started seeing a real uptick in this Nazi content in, in the MENA context, and do you see the failures, the collapse of the Islamic State and some Islamist movements as potentially contributing to that or giving space? I mean, Kali Vest has written about how, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union and Marxist-Leninism in the 1990s gave space for Salafi jihadism to take the mantle of the revolutionary ideology of the day. Do you think that the you know failures in the Islamist movement are, are giving you space for this Nazi movement, or is it a more niche thing that's appealing to different actors? Thanks. One more question, and we'll head over to our, I think we have one at the front. Okay. Oh, finally, the, the uh... In, in case of Malaysia and Indian, also Asian, South Asian relations, a vast majority are South Indians. And in fact, in terms of the Hindu South Indians, they're mainly low caste, not low caste, untouchable. So all of them actually belong to the un, untouchable community. So there is no relationship between the Hindu fundamentalist activities in India run by the Indian state. And that's for uh, uh, Indians in, in Malaysia. Or for that in South, uh, the Indians in UK are primarily from Gujarat. Believe it or not, Gujaratis are over 70% of the Indian population living in UK. I mean, from East Africa and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, and obviously, Balkans don't have very strong relations, mm -hmm. financial relationship with BJP and RSS. So, that relationship, by the way, in, in a conference like this, I think South Asia and particularly Indian far right, because they are the children of Nazism, because the RSS was founded on, on the ideology of Nazism, which is that actually you've got, got to get rid of the Untermensch, which meant Muslims primarily, by the way, getting rid of them actually annihilating them. I'm sorry, that apart. 
I, I will, I will say we only have five minutes, so I can go ask for it. Yeah. Um, how do you explain the fact that, according to the Nazi uh, core ideology, there are untermenschens? For example, Arabs are not anything but untermenschens. How do they reconcile the fact that in a Nazi state, they're not going to belong to the, uh, the superior race? I mean, how do you get, how do you look up all this? That is very interesting. So I'm going to start off with a question to Muna about um, what is illegal to answer Erin's question um, and happy to open it up to, to anybody else on the panel, but I'd love to get her opinion. Um, I'd also love to make sure that we get uh, Mustafa's answers on the last two questions, the uptick in, in Nazi content and um, Nazi perspectives on uh, superiority in the Middle East. And then I'll hand it over to Fula and Munira to answer um, the, the question about where the interventions start. And I think, Fula, I'd like to hear from you and John about um, illegality of content. Okay, so Mona, I'll hand over to you first about illegality of content, um, and then we'll hand up. Oh, I don't think she can hear us. Can you, I think you're muted, Mona. The question, I didn't hear the question clearly, actually. It was, the voice was not clear. So the question is, how do we, to paraphrase Dr. Saltman's questions, how do we address content that's coming from domestic actors when it might not necessarily be illegal and should it be made illegal to help platforms address it? So basically, uh, the Indian, like, you know, Indian media companies, Facebook, when it, when it comes to that, there have been many, you know, inflammatory statements made by uh, the main parties or leaders and stuff like that. So they continue to be still circulated in the social media. And there is not like a proper category to kind of take them down for, uh, for you know, hurting the religious sentiments or something. So in India, it's very prevalent that uh, you will see a lot of uh, pro-Hindutva content, you know, do, making rounds on WhatsApp and Facebook. So as per my experience, what I have observed is there's really, uh, it's very difficult to take such content down. It's still happening and it still keeps circulating aggressively, in fact, on Twitter with hashtags. So it's very difficult to like, you know, crack down on such things, especially when you know that the government is also involved in uh, making the social media, uh, like is also coordinating with the social media companies when it comes to uh, making such policies. So. Okay, thank you so much, Mona. John and Fula, do you want to add on to the illegality challenge? And John, if you're on screen, would love for you to unmute and enjoy the conversation. Let me just quickly say something about what I think about this and perhaps maybe John yeah. can add something to this. So um, in Nigeria, I know there's a cyber warfare command. There is. There's, there's yes. a cyber warfare command, the military owned cyber warfare yeah. command that is dedicated to determining what is legal and illegal. You yeah. know online but then also there's a very thin line because sometimes you have groups that are not necessarily um trying to be violent extremists mm. but basically agitating for some form of legality mm -hmm. and i'll give a very pr practical example so you've got separatist groups mm -hmm. for instance right and separatist groups are all about just trying to get some form of recognition you know for perhaps maybe a reason to want to have to break away from the state, you know, for whatever reasons best known to them. And they perhaps go about this in very legal ways, like mm -hmm. through uh, public protests, peaceful public protests and everything. But for me, and I think John might also be able to add something to this, I think the biggest challenge is always where the, where the, where the state mm. designates these groups as terrorist groups, so proscription regimes. Mm. When they are proscribed as terrorist group, I think the state empowers them mm. to take on illegality. Interesting. I I would love to unpack an additional aspect of this. Yeah. We've seen that, especially in in sub-Saharan Africa. And John, I'd love your your take on this. It to Aaron's point, there are certain groups that serve a purpose for the government, um, where they are either supporting the the counterattacks or participating in subverting um, counter movements on the ground as a supporting faction. They might not be an arm of the government, but they're very much supported and funded. Where do we, where would you both uh, consider those groups, especially if they are causing um, clear violence on the ground? John, interested if you had any takes on the on the wider question on, or on my follow-up. Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, I think in this context, we can we can look at the case of uh, IPOP in Nigeria, mm. indigenous people of the Afra, and uh, the recent uh, separatist group that, uh, that 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 is based in uh, the south in southwestern Nigeria called Agitating for the uh, uh, Yoruba Nation. I think there was a particular time when the Nigerian state dis designated them as a, as a terrorist group. But my concern with this uh, uh, politicization of framing terrorism, in, because based on my recent uh, research, I discovered that some of these uh, groups that, were, that have been agitating for maybe for, for their own state, they, in most cases, they, they have genuine concerns, just like the case of Ambazonia in Cameroon, that you, you know that the, the region has been experiencing a kind of uh, 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 a subordination by the state. And uh, when the, uh, what states usually employ to suppress this agitation, is by designating them as terrorist group. Once they designated them as terrorist group, they will be able to use counter-terrorism operation, you know, to justify whatever uh, instrument they want to use. So my fear regarding this kind of uh, phenomenon is that uh, there should be there should be a, a, a kind of a global coordination, especially. Uh, an institution that will be situated under the United Nations that will look into any if a state or uh, if a state designated a, a particular group as terrorist organization, such an institution, a global institution, supposed to look into it whether they merit that framing, whether they merit uh, the 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 uh, terrorist uh, mm -hmm. comportment. So because some of some of these groups that have been agitating for self-determination have been suppressed by framing them as terrorist organization. So I think there is a need for a global coordination in order not to, uh, you know, to subjugate a genuine cause. Mm -hmm. That's my take. Thank, Thank you. you so much, John. Um, okay, we are at your coffee break time. So I know this is going to make me very unpopular. I'm going to suggest that if you are really eager to get caffeine into your system, you can go right ahead. Um, but I am going to allow for Manira and Mustafa to answer their questions um, swiftly uh, in order to ensure that I can get some caffeine. Um, okay, I'm going to hand it over to, to Mustafa first because you punted last time and then we'll go over to Manira. Uh, I, I am vengeance. Watch me roar. Uh, um, in regards to the Islamic State and collapse and whether or not this is a new thing. Yeah, so when did you see the, the real uptick? So, I, I mean, a lot of these groups started gaining traction during lockdown periods. All right. So, like COVID 19 allowed a lot of people to look stay online for a long time, like uh, exponentially like compared to other years, right? Uh, and what you saw was a rapid development of, uh, of sort of the content that looks and mimics a lot of what we're seeing in the West. So you had edit videos um, that involved, for instance, Iraqi security services with the background, essentially a shift, a shift, uh, a shifting sort of, um, like collage of accelerationist imagery that has been used by like dark foreigner and others that are big in the service. So that sort of stuff is happening. <laughs> However, there's a long, again, there's a long history there of these extreme right movements in, in the region. Um, I think it's changed over the past three years in the way it looks and feels. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just because there's more time to see other people doing it and go, man, that looks cool. This is going to look cool for my people too. And that sort of thing. Can I, can I get you to follow up then? If that looks cool and it's a concept that is very attractive, mm. how do they then align that theory with the fact that they are not going to be the superior race? So there's footage of the, the Muslim Watan 
right? Uh, so, yeah, yeah, it sounds like it. Brilliant. Brilliant. Excellent. There's, there's this footage of these SF soldiers, primarily from the Balkans, praying. There's also, and, and that serves as a reference you know, for these Nazis. Similarly, uh, they often quote, I don't know if it was Goebbels or it was Himmler or one of them talking about, or, or Hitler himself talking about the being Muslim as like that is a great uniting factor for those in North Africa. And to them, they are playing that bit of a game sitting there going, oh, there are Muslim fighters that were part of this. There was also references to tri the, the tradition, the religious tradition by the Third Reich in some shape or form. And then there was also similarly, and this is across acceleration circles globally, the references to uh, Hajj Amin, if you're familiar with the Mufti of Jerusalem, who supposedly wrote to Hitler. Um, he didn't have a really big following in the Middle East, but anyway, that sort of linkage makes them feel a part of that movement and that they are not ultimately outcast by other Nazis. Um, those sort of things keep them engaged. I will... I am not a panelist, so this is take it at your own will. Um, I will say from our on from what we've seen online, this is not unique to the Middle Eastern manifestation of this. This we have the same minority representation within extreme right wing is a is has long been something that's been present, and we've seen it oddly self ascribe a logic that might not be palpable if you're looking at it, you know, non biasly. Um, Manira, you get the honor of keeping these folks uh, from their coffee for another five minutes. Okay, um, where do the interventions start if it's state-backed intrusion? Yeah, I'll talk about intervention, but I have to add on Mustafa's point that even in Malaysia, there is a publication called Hitler Soft Site that talks about the <laughs> Muslim <laughs> excusing and justifying him. Huh? So where does intervention begin? That's a difficult question to answer because it requires a lot of uh, multiple stakeholders uh, approach. And I think Twitter is a very good case study of that because Twitter has been, um, you know, uh, it has been important in, in revolutionary uh, events such as the Arab Spring and, 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 the, uh, and, and what happened in, in Ukraine. And it's a tragedy to see what's happening now and um, with, with Twitter. And that's my point precisely because we need to really reset our understanding of cyber uh, ecosystem and, and the purpose of this, uh, of this uh, social media platform. It is not a private space. It is an extension of the public space. It is our, uh, you know, uh, our uh, virtual town, town square precisely. And so following that, we have to accept and acknowledge the fact that cyber uh, negative cyber policing is going to be the norm and we we need to not normalize this we need to engage and counter this because it's going to be a bigger problem in the future and i've seen instances where uh you know like johnny depp and and amber heard case that's an example of uh, also the bts army that's also an example of of how they mobilize themselves and organize themselves so how do we intervene uh that's if we don't understand how these spaces function, uh, intervention cannot begin. So uh, with, with that said, we have to examine the role of, of uh, cyber, I mean, uh, social media platform. But of course, they are limited by, because they're global, but when they have to operate at domestic level in different countries, they have to comply those laws. And that's one challenge because obviously we've seen instances of, of countries, you know, trying to enforce on them to, to, to limit speech so that's one aspect we have to understand the, the freedom of speech because it's not um we cannot view the world through a very american lens that i have to say that sorry and the other this is, is the panel uh, to say that <laughs> <laughs> sorry and and the other is uh issue is that um what do we mean by we have to strengthen these civil society organizations because uh, uh because of course, they have uh, limitations, and of course, they have to abide by the uh, political players. And there's formal informal relationship between them. And uh, you know, and and at the bottom of that, we have the public uh, who are often being targeted for, for these malicious activities, campaigns, and messaging. Mm -hmm. So intervention begin when we can, you know, properly organize ourselves. But to do that, we have to understand a problem. And again, we have to recognize the limitations because. 
it's difficult to operate in societies where it's very autocratic and it's not democratic. So I don't, uh, I don't know what's the real answer for this. Again, we have to re-examine um, the legal structures, the legal norms, the legal system, and how that can impact us. I mean, what framework we can uh, situate uh, in terms of international level and regional level and then domestic level. Huge thank you to all of the panelists. Thank you for those joining virtually. Thank you for those who attended in person even those who gave me a very difficult time. Um, and I thank you all for your patience and a huge thank you to the GNET team who has been phenomenal and the GIFCT participants. And with that, go get Kathy.